Hey, I'm Tony Moreland, and this is the Samsung Developers Podcast, where we chat with innovators using Samsung technologies, award-winning app developers and designers, as well as insiders working on the latest Samsung tools. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 4. On today's show, I'm joined by Chris Benjaminson, founder of FRVR, the super successful game publisher with over 70 titles on Samsung services. Not only do we chat about monetization and game revenue strategies, but how the FRVR platform has allowed them to scale their global reach. And the music from today's show is from FRVR Games, all composed by Rasmus Hartvig. Enjoy. Hey, Chris, uh, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Tony. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so so I'm excited to chat with you because, you know, we've had game developers on the podcast, but never a game publisher. Let me first ask, though, who is Chris Benjaminson? Like, like that's a good question. Like, if I were to define myself, I think I'd ask, like, two defining characteristics. Like, one is I, I must make things, and the second one is I detest repetition. So, so if you come to my place, it's not unlikely I would cook, uh, but it's very unlikely I, I'm cooking something I made before. So, uh, you know, it might be oh. good, might not, not be good, right? But, you know, that <laughs> that drive to making things like it, it, it can be... Origami, it can be computer games, it can be like it, it doesn't doesn't really matter as long as I, I I'm sort of producing something and then I I really don't like doing things twice, right? You know, like any, anything that's routine is just boring. So you are an explorer then? I guess so. I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> so so you're with FRVR. What exactly is your role and what is FRVR? Like like I'm the I'm the uh, the original founder of the company, right? You know and and. My role today is mostly around working together with massive companies such as Samsung. I, I lead the team at FRVR that does that. And if you if you were to describe FRVR as a company, we're a, a platform and a publisher. Okay. So we have a platform that allows game developers to make fantastic games and with all the services that they need to do to do so. Basically, anything in between a a game developer and a consumer. And then we are also the publisher. We actually make sure that the games get in front of, of, of the right user and have an opportunity to play those games. Okay. What does FRVR stand for? It's an acronym. Does it have a, a deep meaning? No, it's not like like a lot of people are sort of asking us if we are French VR company, which we're not. You oh. know, uh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, but like like FRVR is, is technically forever without the vowels. Okay. You can trademark FRVR. You can't trademark forever, at least uh, not unless you have Apple level money, right? So, uh, <laughs> so it, it, we say FRVR because if you can locally use uh, uh, use sort of the full pronunciation, you can actually use the trademark. So that's a bunch of oh. stupid rules there. Interesting, interesting. So before we dive into FRVR, tell me about your journey. What what led you into the mobile gaming area, and then specifically into uh, creating FRVR? I've been in the in, in the games industry for like more than 20 years. My my first job, sort of professional job ever, was to make a real-time multiplayer games in JavaScript. And FRVR is my seventh startup in, in total. And my seventh? Seventh, yeah. And my, my third platform company overall. So I have like a, a long history of sort of building building companies in this space. And I've been very fortunate. I never, never managed to go bankrupt with one of these companies so far, right? You know, so a little bit proud about that. Oh, that's great. It definitely plays into, you know, when you first started, you had said that, you know, you're, you're not one to repeat uh, much. So you, you said seven companies that you've started. Yeah, all very different companies. And some of them were like, like, like very small and, and never, never got successful or anything like that. Right. You know, sure. it's, uh, like, like the companies apparently gets bigger and bigger every time I try. Yeah, there might be, there might be new startups in the future as well. But, but f- for now, if RBI is, is a very exciting company to work at and, and definitely want to want to spend my time at. So uh, I know in one of those um, companies you had started, you actually, it was a pretty successful company that you ended up selling. Um, but you, you came away with that from a, with, with a lot of lessons learned, I would say. Is that correct? Yeah. So so like like in, in a previous life, built a, a platform called company that did uh, infrastructure for casual mobile social. And in that company, uh, there was a lot of people building games on top of our infrastructure. Okay, uh, like thousands of developers, right? And 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 there was there's a few significant learnings from that. Um, so one was that 
building a company that just charges other people for services is not a particularly good business. A lot of money was made by the developers on top of our platform, and we are not making quite a lot of money. Oh, okay. So, so you, you know, uh, make make sure that that you actually participate where where the value is if you want to be a publisher. And the and the second learning was that the successful developers were not the ones uh, who were the best at making games, right? Really. So there's there's not a strong connection between sort of. Uh, making games that are fun to play and and the uh, economic success that those developers were able to see. So if you want to be successful in the game space, and this is particularly true in the in the mobile game space, you need to be good at a lot of other things that is nothing to do with with game development, such as uh, like user acquisition and revenue optimization and data and all these things. And uh, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But if you are somebody who who really loves making kick-ass games, you're missing the ninety percent. If you also want to be successful at that, it's interesting you say that. You know, I had on the podcast a few weeks ago uh, Peter and Tobias from um, Biodome Games. They have their their game Gold Digger FRVR. Yeah, and uh, I think it was Peter who had a great quote saying that he was chatting with one of his partners who had said, "You know, for once, can you stop trying to be so artistic in your games and just build a game that can be successful?" And, you know, we all had a good laugh at that. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I think all industries are like that, right? You know, you probably have to be good at a, at a multitude of different disciplines to be successful. But the, but the games industry being one of the most valuable entertainment industry in the world is, of course, also one of the most competitive. And that competitive landscape, it, it, it's, a very, it's a very hard place for, for most people to compete. And, and the market sentiment is sort of dominated by survival bias, yeah. right? You know, like like the, the people who won the lottery. Yeah. You know, like like an Among Us or like Flappy Birds. So like these these small teams that had an outsized hit, right? But but that's like winning the lottery. Good luck with that. Yeah, and I think a great example of that right now is is Wordle and the phenomenon behind that. Absolutely. Yeah. A fantastic game, right? You know, and, and like like these small puzzle games once in a while they come along. That was like two thousand forty eight as well. Yeah. Which was also originally made, I think, by by an Italian game developer. You know, just just as a small example, a fantastic, fantastic game as well. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and kind of going back to you know when I mentioned Peter and Tobias, they said that for them, you know, the key to their success was partnering with someone like FRVR, so that they could just focus on on creating the game and let everybody on your team handle everything when it comes to publishing and marketing. So I think there's a huge value with with where you guys are in this space. I hope so. Like that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to allow developers focusing on making fantastic games, and then we take care of all the nitty gritty details of making those games available. And I think we published the 39 platforms, and then wow, uh, also helping those developers make sure that the right users come into the games. Yeah, yeah, right. Because it's not it's not only just about the volume of, of people who play a game. It's 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 more important to make sure that the right user plays the game. Sure. Right. To get the kind of games that I like is not necessarily the kind of games that you like, right? For sure. So let's talk a bit about the history. How long has FRVR uh, been in existence? So I think I think technically the original sort of in, uh, incarnation of the company was founded in must have been 2016. Okay. Okay. Um, and the original version of, of of FRVR was designed to be the biggest, baddest lifestyle company you have ever heard of, uh, <laughs> and sort of sort of allow me to go and travel the world without having to worry about expenses. And it did that. It did that very well. Sure. Like like, sure. like very successfully. However, um, like I'd had a corporate job in corporate America. I, I'd moved to San Francisco at this point in my life uh, after having sold a previous company, and I I sort of managed to convince myself that everything that was wrong with my life was working. Oh. It turned out every, everything that was wrong with my life was working for corporate America, and it took me it took me like three weeks and a whole bunch of success to realize that and and, and decide oh wow that's a big opportunity here in what inevitably came the FIBR that exists today right sure and, uh, yeah I, I teamed up with uh, with a guy called Brian Mydell late joining co-founder he came in and and we we started sort of getting serious about the company a few years after I, the original founding. Ah, and it was Brian actually who had told Peter, "Hey, for once, put artistic stuff aside and, and let's focus on on you know how to be successful here." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like he's a fantastic executor, right? You know, and that's uh, like like good at building big teams and sort of running productions. A lot of repetition, stuff I don't like, right? Yeah, he's really good at that. <laughs> that's great. So, how many employees are are at FRVR? 
Yeah, so uh, I, I think we are 130 now as of wow. as of today. But yeah, like like we we find ourselves in a situation right now where we are onboarding around 11 new people a, a month. So you are growing. Yeah, yeah. Every time you ask that question, the number will have changed. <laughs> <laughs> now, are these people are they focused in one headquarters, or are you guys, you know, all around the globe? We have most of our people in uh, in Lisbon, in Portugal, and that's predominantly where we are focusing on hiring. Okay, you know, post COVID, the world has changed, and you know, we we absolutely uh, accept that some people want to be wherever it is they want to be. Sure, we also we also have offices in Denmark. We have offices in United Kingdom and. Uh, we have an, a small office in Malta as well, uh, and a small office in Spain. So, so we have we have sort of different opportunities for people who wants to to work in an office. Got it. And then the majority of people are now in in, in Lisbon, Portugal, and that's also where we are mostly doing our hiring. You yourself, though, you are in the UK, is that correct? Yeah, I'm in London, right? You know, I get to I get to be a, a special snowflake and decide where I want to live. <laughs> so I live in London. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, uh, under the FRVR brand, how many game studios do you guys have that you're working with? Like we, we are a publisher, right? You know, so uh, we, I think presently we work with around 20 okay. uh, other studios, right? So it's, it's a, a non-insignificant amount, but we have higher aspirations. We want to get to a, a place where we can work with hundreds, if not thousands of developers sure. to, to do fantastic things. So how many monthly players do you get playing FRVR games on, on all channels? I get say it, it varies, right? Like like a lot of our success comes from viral traffic, right? Okay. So our monthly active users can range from like on a really bad month, 50 million to oh. a good month <laughs> where we where we peak into like like a hundred plus million monthly active wow. users. Wow. Monthly active users. That's crazy. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of people. Uh, so far, I think... Like, like it's it's a number we track. We think we've had around 1.6 billion absolute uniques for the lifetime of the company. Wow! And that is just in you know you said 2016 was the the start of FRVR. Yeah, I, I, I fail to remember. It might have been 15, right? But yeah, like plus plus, plus minus a year. Sure. So now let's talk about Samsung and, and Galaxy Store uh, with FRVR. What are some of the uh, popular titles that you guys offer on Galaxy Store? So, so particularly on the Galaxy Store, like like we have, I think we have like uh, twelve games live there. Mo- most notably is is Gold Digger FRVR, which uh, which is built by by Peter and team. Sure. And then we have sort of our higher end games like a basketball and a hex. And uh, however, we we do work with something in other ways as well. They have this instant type product as well, where we are also present. And we have, I don't know, I think we've done like seven or eight different in- integration with Samsung along the years. So so we are, we are, we are sort of everywhere on a Samsung phone, including the the Galaxy App Store. Okay. So not just the Galaxy App Store, but there's there's other different platforms that Samsung offers that FRVR is involved in. Yeah, so we work with we work with Samsung about building an experience in like our first integration was was in a product called Bixby minus one home screen. So when you swiped yeah. uh, left on your on your phone, like we would, we were in there, we had a a, a a card where there was sort of quick links to our games. Uh, okay, we we build a instant games type product together with Samsung. We work quite a lot on that together, and we have our games live there. Uh, we also have integrations with the with the browser, and like we're exploring basically. A, b- a big part of what FRVR is is rather than trying to drag the user to where uh, we want them to be, say a mobile app store, we try to take the model and turn it inside out and bring people great games wherever they have already decided they want to be because it's very costly to drag a user somewhere else, right? I see. So if they're already there, you want to make your game available to them. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, if you're, if you're Starbucks, right, people won't care if you can only get it in the airport. You, they actually have to be on a street corner close to where people sort of walk around. Otherwise, nobody is ever going to drink their coffee. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So how, how did this relationship with Samsung first start? Uh, I th- we met Samsung at a, at a conference and they were like, can you give us games in like four months, I think, was the, was the original uh, question and we we got the games to them in two days oh wow so the answer was yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's a great way to start the relationship oh yeah 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 so why would you say it's important to offer your game on uh, on galaxy store like again you know there, there's users there who love the galaxy store 
And we, we want to have our games available to those users in, in, in that space. And the Galaxy Store is actually well performing, right? You know, it's, it's a Samsung product and Samsung phones are very high end devices generally. It's, it's a very, not only is it, it's great to meet the consumer where they are, they are also very high value users when people are playing from the, from the Samsung Galaxy App Store. Yeah. In what ways would you say Galaxy Store has helped you promote, um, the FRVR games? First of all, the Galaxy Store is a fairly competent product in, it has all the features you would expect as a game developer. Right, you know, so so great access to in their purchases, great access to notifications, great access to distribution, right? But we've also we also really enjoyed working together with the Samsung Galaxy team, and we have, like, among other things, we have an FRVR category in the Galaxy Store that's sort of exclusive to us. It's it's only our games. Oh, nice! You know? And uh, we we work together on seasonal featuring, and they give feedbacks to us, uh, you know, saying, hey, we think it would be fantastic if we could do some something around easter for instance right? sure and then uh, we go and work on that together and sort of find a, a a process that works well together for both of us that's great and i'm sure that banner promotions are, are part of that is that yeah banner promotion and icon promotions and and like there's there's a lot of tools that samsung has in the toolbox to help out right yeah and and, and we also push on the galaxy team to do more <laughs> like we we've sent a lot of feedback on the on the backend tools and and things like that and 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 fantastically it has impact like we get better product right so so for us that's that's a fantastic partnership yeah and, and that's one of the things that actually pulled me into uh, working for samsung was how open they were to feedback and wanting to improve their platform fantastic you know, you'd mentioned uh, Gold Digger FRVR. Um, uh, those are the guys. They won our 2021 Best of Galaxy Store Award for Best Instant Play Game. Awesome game. Awesome guys. We were so happy to give that award. Tell me, what did it mean for FRVR to have one of your games win a Best of Galaxy Store Award? It's a, it's a privilege, right? You know, and the credit goes to the game developer. Yeah. They made that game. Yeah. Right. You know, we, we supported them along the way and... and and of course, came with a lot of feedback and helped them with technical issues and things like that. But at the end of the day, you know, we, we, we have to be honest about the fact that the great games are made by the great developers, right? And, and also as a platform publisher, provide the tools to make that a possibility. But games are fundamentally a creative endeavor and you need massively creative people to to make to make those games. Like, sure. I'm, I'm a game developer myself as well, right? You know, and I'm almost almost more proud of some of the games I built than than you know the very successful company that FRBI is, right? You know, because you know, so it's it's sort of an expression of something where where you sat down and said, Here, "Here's a thing I want to create," and, and now now I've gotten it out, right? And I think uh, to be as in Peter completely deserves getting that that recognition from the Galaxy team. Yeah, yeah. Success for a game definitely revolves around revenue. Tell me, uh, as far as FRVR, what has been your strategy for generating revenue? Like, so, so from a from a technical side, right? You know, we try to we try to make all avenues of of generating revenue available in our platform, right? So that means institutional based advertisement. It means reward based advertisement. It means in app purchases. It means subscriptions. Um, it actually does not mean, mean banner advertisement. We don't do that because I don't like it. Oh, really? But, you know, other, uh, yeah, other than that, uh, like like we, we, we sort of have all the technical capabilities. And then what we find and what we try to optimize for is, is not revenue. We try to optimize for engagement. Okay. And there, there's a multitude of reasons for that. Like, so, so like one is the fact that I think I can't remember the specific number, but it's more than 90% of all value that is captured in a game is made by people who play the game more than once. Yeah. Right. You really want to have these long engagements with people, right? And and another a fairly simple reason is it's it's a lot easier to take a game that has huge engagement and turn it into a good business than it is to take a game with a with a strong monetization model and turn it into a great game, right? So so fundamentally, everything we focus on, all our KPIs, all our, our visions and missions are uh, around building experiences that people want to engage with for a long time. And then revenue is something that happens as a result thereof, uh, okay. uh, rather than being sort of a driving factor. And, and because we are good at distribution, because we 
we are not sort of participating in the race to the bottom that is cost positive use acquisition on app stores. We can take the privilege that it is to be less aggressively monetizing than some of our competitors are. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about some of the specifics here when it comes to, you know, different ways to generate revenue. Um, you know, there's developers out there that may just be getting started in this space. And so I want to help explain what some of those are. So IAP is is in-app purchase. Kind of explain like what is an in-app purchase. Yeah, so in in-app purchase is if you can somehow convince a user to pay for something in the game, right? You know, and and how they pay is actually quite different across the world. So Northern Europe or USA, right? Americas, uh, it's typically through a credit card. Okay. But if you're talking about a, a consumer in India, it's typically through a, a gift card or something like that, where they, they've gone into a store and sort of funded their wallet, right? But, oh, okay. But the fact of the matter is what what essentially ends up happening is you have you have an experience in your game that the user feels is worth the value of, of, of paying for. And again, you know, like, like, like talking about engagement in games, right? Uh, why, why would a user be willing to to sort of exchange money for something in a game. And that's typically related to the user's expectation of, of also playing this game in two weeks from now, right? Yes, they're investing. Yeah, you're investing in your future experience in this game, right? You know, so so it, it's another place where this, this long-term engagement becomes very important, right? But a lot of times what people are buying are like simple things like more lives or an item or whatever it is that sort of and in some of our games that are multiplayer we, we even have people playing for for things that are purely sort of cosmetic buying a different hat because then other people can see they have that hat but the hat the hat has no function right sure so it's just being able to um create their own identity you know within that game yeah, it's no different than people buying clothes in the real world you know sure sure so how do you look at your player demographics for getting the best returns on iap I, well, first of all, that's a per game thing, right? You know, so we have we have games that appeal to uh, fifty plus women, sure, and we have games that appeal to uh, like like uh, a, a young male audience, right? So that's that's very individualized per game. Um, fundamentally, though, there are some there are some core mechanics that always work really well if you can proposition a user to to exchange money for time yeah so something where they can progress faster if they if they put money in it's, it's typically a very strong mechanic regardless of who the consumer is and then like we do, we do the thing that successful game developers do we spend a lot of time looking at data and looking at you know what are the flows that leads to a conversion so somebody actually putting money into the system how do we how do we balance those those metrics such that we sort of get the most statistical value of uh, and and we use we use tools such as a b split testing okay where you you run you run two versions of the game at the same time and then you measure which one performs better and then you sort of uh, make that the version that everybody plays yeah yeah no that that's great i've heard of that that is a pretty important aspect not just in the gaming industry but just with you know ads and, and marketing to do uh, a b testing yeah, we, we even do something. It's called multivariant testing, right? And I, we should not go into the details, but it becomes very <laughs> complex very quickly. Sure, sure. So, so what other mobile game monetization models do you uh, consider? Like, like you know, premium paid apps or, or paid user acquisitions? You had mentioned that we did experiment a little bit with premium paid apps, but it's a very it's a very tough market, and 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 it's not it's not something where we found a lot of a lot of success like we generally see more success when we can just sort of allow anyone to play the games and not yeah. not having that limitation right and we do do uh, both interstitial based advertisement which is unprompted and then rewarded video type advertisement where the user gets a reward for watching an advertisement but where the user sort of opts to watch an ad right you know so you could imagine that so, so this is during gameplay there would be a moment where then a, a video would play and they would watch that yeah, so 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 a simple example could be you know that you have just died, yeah, and you can revive by watching an advertisement or paying a coin. Oh, okay, right. So giving the user the choice between say watching an advertisement and spending a bit of their time versus spending a, a, a bit of their money, right? You know, so and and it's a very high value format. Uh, yeah. be, because the user have, have elected to watch an advertisement, so you know the users there. Yes, you know they are engaged and uh, they're just sitting there and waiting, right? So, so advertisers are typically willing to pay a, a, a high price for for that type of advertisement. And, and you had mentioned interstitial ads. So, explain what that is for someone who's who's new to game development. Yeah, so it, it, it's a bit like the ads you get on television. So something is happening on your screen, and then suddenly there's an advertisement, and something else is happening, right? You know, so it's it's an ad that is that is shown to the user. Okay. 
like interstitial technically means uh, means an advertisement that runs before something starts, right? But it's used interchangeably in the games industry to mean like an ad before something starts, an ad in the middle of something, or an ad after something happens. Okay. We we try to be cautious of of, of using those type of advertisements, sort of out of order. Like we don't want to interrupt a, a, a user while they're playing. Yeah. So we would typically only put those in. So like for whatever reason, your game session has ended and you have just elected to press play again. Yeah. And that's why we would put in those type of advertisement. You, you do have games out there, which like you can imagine you're playing a solitaire game and then boop, an ad pops up in the middle of it, right? And you have to sit down and wait so you can continue your game. And we try to, to steer away from that. I see, I see. Um, what about subscriptions? Have you guys run any subscription models on your games? Yeah, we've run a we've run a, a few experiments uh, here and there. It's it's a, it's a relatively new area of monetization for us, but we have run run experiments where our games has been sort of presented as a games club. So rather than having advertisement or having uh, inner purchases in the game, you could just play them completely for free if you had a subscription through a through a partner. Sure, right. Uh, and some of our deeper games, the, the kind of stuff we're building now, definitely lends itself well towards being able to support subscriptions. Uh, subscriptions to free to play games these days mostly expresses themselves as season passes. So you, you you like buy a season pass subscription and then you get like extra rewards while you play for a period of time and then. That time period that are, is up, and then you know you can buy the next season pass as well, or continue your subscription or whatever it is. Right? You know that's that's the model of like a like a Fortnite or those type of games. Got it. So so we've talked about in-app purchase IAP. Um, you know, there's another category to monetization called IAA, which is in-app advertising, and I think under that falls the you know the rewarded videos, um, these interstitial ads. I've also heard of something called offer walls. Can you explain what is an offer wall? Yeah, we we actually don't think we have any any games live with offer walls anywhere. But it's it's basically you know you, you can get a reward in your game for doing another action, right? So so again, it's it's user opt in. The user wants something, and for an offer wall, it's typically like extra extra coins or whatever in the game, and to get a to get sort of a a list of different options for things they could be doing right now to have some level of value, and that that can go all the way from you know signing up to a website. All the way up to you know committing yourself to f- four years of serious XM radio in the US. Oh, right? really? You know, or, or whatever, right? You know, and there's <laughs> there's different types of, of reward levels of that, right? Uh, so, but but they they can be significant, right? So, like that, it's it's sort of a way for other companies to interact with that consumer and, and get them to do something that has value to them, and they then pay you for that service so it's a bit sort of a direct affiliate program or something like that okay okay like, yeah. okay interesting so you know a lot of what we talked about now have been in game um you know advertising for monetization so what about uh, paid user acquisition so actually going out there and advertising for your games are you guys uh, active in that area not particularly it's something we are exploring and it is something that i believe it's, it's going to be very important for the future of fabia yeah but historically it's not something that we we done to a, a a huge extent. Um, however, it is an area where we actually partner with the Samsung Galaxy App Store team, where we are we're looking at what is the best path for somebody who is publishing on the Samsung Galaxy App Store to to find sort of pockets of users that can be that can be purchased, right? Okay, okay. So, of all these different ways that we've talked about when it comes to monetization, what would you say is the most effective way, and and why? Um, so there's many answers to that. What has been the most successful for FRBR so far is advertisement. Okay. And that, that has mostly down to the kind of games that we have been building historically. Uh, and the kind of games we've been building historically has mostly been a result of the capabilities of the platforms our games have been available on, which by and large have not supported in their purchases. However, if you were to look at where is the most potential value, it's most definitely in in the inner purchase space, right? Like the potential value that you can derive from a single user is larger in in inner purchases than any other way you can monetize that user, even with subscriptions, right? Like some simple math, you know, uh, rewarded video is, is, is considered valuable, right? But if you have a player sort of watching a thousand ads a month, that might sort of in the United States be worth $20 or thereabouts. Uh, where twenty dollars is is not an uncommon average transactions for a single user to spend in their purchases, right? And people typically buy more than once. Sort of the the opportunity to 
create a great business around in their purchases is much higher than the opportunity to create a great business purely from advertising. Got it. What would you say would be some uh, advice that you can give for a developer looking to integrate IAP or, or IAA? Like, like it, it goes back to what we talked about earlier, right? You know, build deep experiences, right? Sure, for long engagements. Yeah, long engagements and then then allow people to buy something that they, you know, feel like they're going to get value from from a long period of time. Right. And and I think an important thing there is you you must be trustworthy as a developer. Yeah. Right. You know, like 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 the, 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 the player must trust you to not sort of screw them over. So if you have all kinds of other stuff in the games where they feel cheated, they're not gonna give you their money. Or if you cheat them, they're only gonna do it once, right? Yeah. You know, so you actually have to provide something that brings real value to the user. Otherwise they're they're not gonna engage with that thing. Like like they're not they're not stupid. They are very clever. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, how you guys go about acquiring games for FRVR. What do you look for? Like we look for for great teams, and and I think it's important here that we, we are publisher, right? So we we yeah. work with developers uh, who take a fair amount of the total risk of building a game. Sometimes we fund the games, right? But predominantly we work with great teams that is passionate about the, the game that they're working on, and that's that's mostly what we look for. Okay. Uh, and then we, we we help those those developers to go and. and and build fantastic games, right? But uh, due to the nature of our platform, at least how it's structured right now, you must basically build the game from scratch on top of our stuff. So so we're not a publisher that can sort of accept a, a game that somebody has already built and say, yeah, we will publish that. It's more sort of a co- collaborative co-development process where we work together with, with developers to create fantastic things that work on top of our platform. You know, I, I heard somewhere that, that between 50 to 1,000 games are added to app stores every day. Yeah. Um, so I know, you know, there's a huge competition when it comes to games. What's your, your strategy for discoverability? Like, like, as we talked about, go to the user where they are rather than trying to drag them to the app store where it's, it's very competitive, right? And like we use, we use all, all the tricks, including branding. Like we, we now have significant volume of people just searching for our games every day. Both in the app stores and on Google, right? And and like truly, did that basic strategy of saying let's let's bring our games to where the users are has been very very successful for us and allowed us to sort of get in front of all of these consumers without diving deep into cost positive user acquisition and things like that. And and the, the general app stores like they're hyper competitive. Yeah, like it's very very hard to get your your game there, right? And people talk about all of these things like. Uh, influencer marketing and whatever and they don't call it use acquisition but that's just what it is right you know it's just sure. a different way of doing it right you know it, it's all of these hacks to try to get in front of a user so are you using um uh, tools like creating promotional trailer videos and posting them on youtube we do we do that for for some of our, our deeper games like a game like world's frvr yeah uh, there's a there's a content team that creates content uh, for social media uh, that being you know, YouTube and Facebook, and I think we even have posts on TikTok. Okay. So you guys have a ton of experience now when it, when it comes to publishing games. Uh, I'm sure you faced a few challenges. Can you share some stories and how you overcame those those challenges? A lot of our challenges is, is around scale, right? You know, so we have 70 games on 39 platforms, right? Wow. And that in, that in itself is is a big number, right? To uh, to sort of to sort of manage just like that's more than 2,000 co- combinations, almost 3,000 combinations, right? We also have all of those games in 20 languages. So, so when you when you sort of factor in those combinations, that's that's 50,000 combinations, right? And if you want localized screenshots, yeah, that's no way you could do that with humans, right? And and a lot of ways we try to solve it with technology, right? That's what the what the FRVR platform does. Okay, encapsulate just the complexity of trying to do all of these things into into sort of a unified platform, and that goes for what is a good experience on the Samsung Galaxy App Store. Like the Samsung Galaxy App Store has specific capabilities and specific APIs and specific uh, sort of things that work particularly well on that platform. And uh, if every developer had to consider that for all the platforms we were on, they they they, they would be spending none of their time making great games. So we, we encapsulate that complexity into our platform. And that's sort of the recipe that makes FIVR work, that, that sort of removing humans from the equation, basically. That's interesting. I mean, I, I can totally see how you guys are able to, to scale your, your reach with um, having so many games, but you've got quite a team behind. So it's not all uh, automated. Um, you still do need to have those employees to support that. 
yeah, but but, but like ninety five percent of those people work on the platform, right? They built the they built the infrastructure, right? And, and FRBR is also a company that's been growing quite a lot. I think. Okay. Two years ago, we were we were fewer than twenty people, right? So a lot of the people who are actually working at FRBR now are, are people who who joined us in the last year. So, what are some of the trends that you've seen in the uh, in the gaming industry? Oh, that's that, 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 that's a lot of them, right? You know, there's a. Uh, I, 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 like I think the the saddest trend I see is is when you have say an Among Us or a Fall Guys or, or yeah. a Flappy Birds come out and and be successful like like all the people who try to get success by just following that recipe, right? Not realizing that the reasons those games were successful originally were were sort of a bit of luck and timing, and and typically some some external factors like Among Us grew with Discord and Discord grew with Among Us yeah right and that was sort of sort of the game to play on that platform right and all, all the other games in that in that category uh, by and large failed because it was just like another game with that right and and a thing I think a lot of people have forgotten is that the game industry is is cyclical right so you you get a new channel it comes out it's it's very cheap and and easy to get users on it initially, and then as the value of that platform goes up, it just becomes more and more expensive, right? And and people have sort of forgotten that's how the games industry used to work because mobile came along, yeah, and stuck around for for a very long time due to due to sort of these these stores that were tied to specific devices, right? Which which is something you didn't really have on a on a PC where where there was more open competition on on who could sort of have an app store. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So tell me, what is in the future for FRVR? A lot more high quality games. Like that's basically our focus right now. We we are very fortunate. We just closed our uh, our A round funding. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. And uh, and like like the entire theme of of that funding is we need we need games of a completely different quality, right? So we are we are looking for fantastic studios who can come in and 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 build games uh, with sort of that that depth that can support in our purchases. That's the thing yeah. that we really want to focus on. We want to we want to have games that can have people play for years, not just months, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so as FRVR is seeing this growth, um, what are you guys doing related to uh, diversity and inclusion? We do a lot of things, right? Like the diversity and inclusion is something that we try to sort of have both across our games and across across our company culture, right? So, it could be everything from. Like I personally created the Hex FRVR game. Oh yeah. I, I got a nice email from somebody who said, I love this game, but I can't, the colors, I can't see the different things, right? So uh, making sure yeah. that you're aware of the different kinds of color blind that people can be. Sure, sure. And it also, it also means a lot for hiring. Like, like, like what's, what's the best candidate for the job? It's not necessarily the person that fits the checklist, the best that you, that you put on your. On yeah. All the requirements. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like diverse teams perform better. So diversity is a, is a virtue in, in the hiring process, and it can be advantageous to hire the, the the more diverse candidate if you have an opportunity to hire too. And like, but it means a lot. Like, you have to be mindful of it everywhere. Those those yeah. like natural biases, right? And a simple example of that is that the more bullet points you put on a on a job post about specific requirements, the less likely it is that females would uh, will, will apply for that job. Interesting. Like, like a male candidate would sort of look at a long bullet point and, and see two things they're good at and go, yeah, I, I could totally do this, right? Yeah. Where where a, a female will see a long list and sort of say, I can only do two of these things. I shouldn't apply for this, right? So so it's, you, you have to be mindful of those things all the way. Interesting. Yeah, I think giving someone the opportunity to really talk about their personality and, and their value is is probably the best way to go about finding that the good candidate. Yeah, and, and, and it's a big part of our, it's a big part of our sort of, sort of sort of hiring flow is is the values right you know yeah. we, are, we are also a a company in portugal that doesn't behave like a portuguese company that's a p- particular company company structure in, in portugal that's very hierarchical right you know it's a, some people might call it a bit old-fashioned yeah that's not the company we are that's not the company we want to be so we, we, we want pay people that resonates with sort of a more flat structure and modern ways of of, of working wonderful so if someone is interested either in working for FRVR or they're a, a game studio that want to bring their games to you, what's the best way for them to, to reach out to FRVR? 
like like send me an email first, right? You know, and you know, I, I'll redirect you to the right person. My email is chris at frbr.com. So it's fairly straightforward, right? Like like always happy to chat with people who do fantastic things. Yeah, that's great. And we'll include links in the show notes to uh, much about what we talked about today and, and to FRVR's uh, website. So, Chris, I got to say, it was great to have you on the podcast. I love learning all about FRVR and what you guys are doing. But, but let me ask, when you're not working for FRVR, what is it that you like to do for fun? I find most of my spare time is, is, is taken up by, you know, walking the dog or, or, you know, cooking food if it's summer like I'm, I'm probably not good at cooking food in the winter but you know like <laughs> i like to grill outdoors and whatever right you know and and i actually try to keep a fairly strict work-life balance wonderful so you know I, I i i'm one of the people who like going to the office but mostly as a way to not work while i'm at home oh, that's great well hey we're just about to hit the uh spring time of the year and soon will come summer so i'm sure you're gonna enjoy lots of outdoor grilling when the uh, when the season comes hopefully yeah, you, n- you never know with the uh, summer in London, right? You know, that might be like two days where it's a possibility. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, hey, Chris, really appreciate you coming on the podcast today. No, thank you so much for having me. Looking to start creating for Samsung? Download the latest tools to code your next app. Or get software for designing apps without coding at all. Sell your apps to the world on the Samsung Galaxy Store. Check out developer.samsung.com today and start your journey with Samsung. The Samsung Developers Podcast is hosted by Tony Moreland and produced by Jeannie Sue.